Welcome to Talking Pictures Trivia, the podcast in which a group of geographically challenged friends explore movies through trivia as an excuse to keep their friendships alive. I'm one of these friends, and today's host, Nick, and with me is... Tom. KJ. And Pat. For those joining us for the first time, we start off each episode with a movie quiz, as these four rapid-fire trivia questions will determine who earns today's trivia crown. The first question question is worth one point and each question after that is worth one more point then we'll follow it up with a theme discussion this week being down these mean streets a man must go thanks to our guest pat for picking the movie this week tom tell us about today's movie walking up to theaters in 1941 we would have had to choose between lady scarface here comes mr jordan dumbo and today's movie the maltese falcon so the maltese falcon follows san francisco sleuth sam spade and he is hot on the trail of a collection of criminals who may or may not be responsible for the death of his partner at the center of it all is an exciting mystery that dates back to the 16th century as we watch sam spade uncover the secret of the Maltese Falcon. It's time for question one. Who calls the police when first Cairo, played by Peter Lorre, visits Sam, the main detective, played by Humphrey Bogart's apartment? Locked in. Locked in? Locked in. Oh, all right, Nick, you locked in last. What do you have? It's been a few weeks since I watched this movie. I believe it was The Partner's Widow. That's my guess. KJ, what do you have? I have his secretary, but I think it's wrong. And Pat, what do you have? Yeah, Nick's right. It's Iva, Iva Archer, the wife. All right, Woo. very good. <laughs> Points for Nick and Pat. It's time for question two. What gets taken off of the doors and windows? Locked in. Locked in. Also locked in. All right. Sorry, Nick, you did lock in last, but what do you have? The deceased partner's name. Okay. KJ, what do you have? Yeah, his partner's name, but I don't know. You know, if Nick was asking the questions, it would be his partner's name and his name were taken off in order to put his name back on. His name alone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. And Pat, what do you have? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I was going to say Archer, have Archer taken off all the windows, but I suppose the and also had to be taken off the preposition. And re-centered. They're not going to just leave. They <laughs> probably had to re-center because it, he said have Sam Spade put on. Mm -hmm. So probably they had to take Spade mm -hmm. off to re-center <laughs> Sam Spade. But if we're, you know, so so, it, so we had to take Spade and Archer after re-center Sam Spade. But, but yeah. Spade will be there in the end. So the yeah, only thing that came off. <laughs> but the and also definitely had to be taken off. Yeah. So I, I have a feeling that all of us got the points on this <laughs> one. So. Yes, and that is correct. It has been Archer. Now we've had a nice debate about did the and come off? I, I guess it all came off and Samuel Spade was what was replaced. Prominently. Prominently, yeah. But there we go. Points for all. It's time for question three. What are the three names the Fen Fatale gives herself? Locked in. Locked in with a joke, and it's not even a good joke. Three names? Or she like... goes by three separate names. And you, you don't have to have the full name. You just give me the family name. <laughs> yeah, Nick, just get the family name. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I never do this, but I'm going to lock in and I'm going to have to pass. Mm -hmm. Ah, man, I was in contention too here. Okay. I got nothing. I got nothing. Not even oh. a bad joke like KJ, you know? Oh, All right. It's pretty bad. KJ, what's your bad joke? I have the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Okay, you lose right. <laughs> <laughs> So KJ is down to one point. Um, and Pat, what do you have? 
So the first name she gives herself is Wonderly because she comes in and she says her name is Miss Wonderly. That is the name that she first hires mm-hmm. Sam Spade as. The second name is only mentioned very briefly, but she gives herself the name LeBlanc because that is the name that she stays in the hotel as. Mm-hmm. And she tells Sam that she will be staying in the hotel under the name LeBlanc. And then the third name she gives herself, which is the name they use for the rest of the movie, whether or not it's actually her real name or not, I mean, it probably is, but you don't really know, is Bridget O'Shaughnessy. That is the name that she uses for the rest of the film. Okay, very good. That is correct. This doesn't put KJ or I in a good position. <laughs> no. Final question. Yeah. Mm. Well, the final question, we have Pat at six, KJ at two, and Nick at three. So it's so, got to be a three-pointer, right? It's a four-pointer, right? Because It's a four-pointer. Four-pointer, even better. Yeah. All right, here we go. Um, actually, this ironically is probably the easiest question, but I'm sweating. We... that's not good because okay. Pat don't get it. <laughs> okay. Let's see, this is the problem is if I get it wrong, then it's really, <laughs> <laughs> really bad. <embarrassing. Bruce> hubris. <laughs> like the episode of Jeopardy where they didn't know what the fifth letter of the alphabet was or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? I didn't... A lot yeah. of pressure. A lot of pressure yeah. on that stage. Yeah, fair enough. It's time for question four. For about two thirds of the movie, where is the bird? Locked in. Also locked in. I'm sorry. Did did he not say what is he in the Jeopardy question? <laughs> <laughs> he really didn't. No one rang in. It was. It wasn't. He was. What is this? It, it was. What is the seventh letter of the oh, alphabet? The seventh letter. No yeah. one even rang in. That's a little trickier. Um, Literally, no one. <laughs> I would be counting on it's my still fingers. Still breaking. He didn't even know what he was breaking. What is G? Um, locked in. All right, Keisha, what do you have? Is it in the coat check? Okay. Uh, an answer uh, or a question? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that stopped me. But um, all right, Nick, Nick, what do you have? It was on a ship. Okay, and Pat, what do you have? Yeah, it's on the La Paloma. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, All right. <laughs> I'm going to say uh, my answer here was Hong Kong because La Paloma was coming from Hong Kong. Is it on? No, on it was on the ship. Do you know how long Hong. it takes for those ships to cross? <laughs> like, I suppose, yeah, yes, so it's on the ship the whole time. Okay, fair enough. So I'll give points to. Um, it doesn't help me either way. Yeah, points Pat to Nick and Pat. <laughs> I was being more specific. Mm-hmm. Were you? Yeah, on the boat in the coat check. <laughs> no, it you was in the what? bird check. How do we give the points to KJ? Because then Nick comes in last. So I'm willing. Like... <laughs> oh, it's not enough for you to win. You need to make sure I'm destroyed. <laughs> oh, all right. And it looks like Pat is our flawless victor today. Congratulations. Yay. You've seen this film and read about this film <laughs> and everything else. Yes. yes. Too well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be diving into our topic of the week. Down these mean streets, a man must go. See you right after the break. Join another Talking Studios production, Limited Lexicon, where we play through text-based adventure games. Text-based adventure games were computer games from before computers had graphics. The game uses text to describe a scene, and the player types back how they want to interact with the game. I'll read the text from the computer, and my co-host will feed me commands. This season, we're playing through The Hobbit from 1982 on the ZX Spectrum. Here's a quick sample. I thought uh, a lot about our first command, and I think it should be no print, because we don't want to print things as we're going along. I think by default... It's not going to print. And even if I did print, where is it going to print to? 1982? I I would imagine if we go west, we're going to be south of the troll, right? Just south of the troll land. Let's try it. You go west. The troll's clearing. The visible. Oh, we died. (laughs) 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 All right. The The troll saw us and killed us. So I think we have to see the answer to the riddle then. The answer is dark. Say dark, I think. Talk to what? Gollum. Gollum. Say Gollum dark. You talk to Gollum. Thorin says, hurry up. And we died. And we died. 
So we went northeast last time. So let's go southwest. You go southwest. Visible exits are north, northwest. You see the valuable golden ring. Oh, we're wow. ending it here. That's wait, wait, wait. perfect. Oh, That's wow. perfect. Limited Lexicon, coming to your podcatcher and YouTube in late 2022 by Talking Studios. And we're back. Time to explore this week's topic, Down These Mean Streets a Man Must Go. Pat, what the heck does that mean? So the phrase, the phrase comes from um, probably the the other... So Dashiell Hammett sort of writes, you know, sort of some of the, the great film noir or sort of these the sort of noir detective types. Um, the other, you know, arguably great writer of these things is, is um, Raymond Chandler. And he created the character Philip Marlowe, who's in things like uh, The Big Sleep is is probably one of the main ones um, with Humphrey Bogart, um, which is a fair famous one. But um, Chandler wrote a very famous essay called The Simple Art of Murder. And his sort of thing is he discusses in that is that he, he, a lot of it is he's criticizing sort of what is now known as like the cozy mystery, the sort of um, Dorothy Sayers or Agatha Christie style murders where people murder in these weird exotic ways and they have all these you know sort of lots of characters and they're all sort of usually trapped in some place you know there's basically none of them would ever happen that way and so what he he sort of advocates is um and he talks a lot about Dashiell Hammett and he talks about these ideas of crime movies need to give crime back to the criminals who commit crimes not to you know, old dames in, you know, using tropical fish to murder people. Like it should be, the crime is brutal. It's mean, it's harsh. We need to actually give it back to those people who do these types of things. And then he talks about sort of the private detective as being sort of this person who stands above this fray. He kind of hints that a lot of it is like modern knighthood, that these are, these are modern, modern knights. They're chivalric. They're meant to sort of go out into the world. And he says, literally the idea is that down these mean streets, a man must go, that some person has to stand there almost as this barrier between crime and everything else. And so a lot of what these kind of noir films are doing is literally, that's kind of the goal is give crime back to criminals, make it dark, make it gritty, make it harsh. And I think this is one of those films that sort of does that. I mean, this nobody nobody looks good here. You know, even Sam Spade doesn't look good. And I think that's that's part of the way the film's meant to work. And I think it's really it's such a cool trend in film from this time period. Do hmm. you think Batman fits that bill? Definitely. I think he's he's definitely in that. And, and I think that's actually probably exactly along the same lines. As you said, it's this night idea that some person has to. There's even this idea that like the private detective is almost tainted because he sort of goes into crime and by by being involved in crime, he himself is now sort of shunned. He's sort of outside society. And if he, especially when you get to the end there where he has to give up and now he has to give up the, the love of his life who's murdered you know multiple people but he sort of has to do this thing and he he can't he can never really have like a normal life is almost the implication yeah i that is interesting and i think what i mean sam does come off bad in this as you're saying uh, he also comes off kind of above the criminals i guess he still has that kind of night code right because he is loyal to a particular code his own code though tom right I, well, it's also the code still, of detectives. Yeah, yeah, but he's still also very loyal to his partner, but he was also sleeping with his wife. <laughs> yeah, it's it's <laughs> like the, it's interesting. But what but Pat's saying about how like the detective is sort of um tainted by the darkness he's in. Sam is following these codes and he doesn't seem to like have emotionally digested them. He it's just sort of like you just do this thing. This is what you're supposed to do when you're a detective. And it's good for you as a detective to do these things. It's good for detectives everywhere. There's something like bizarrely vacant in his loyalty to this code. I don't know. I don't know if anybody else felt that way. Well, um, his morality is a little skewed. So mm -hmm. in certain regards to his profession, he's this honorable person that can't break the code. But in his like personal life it's you know no holds bar and anything's fair game like it's a very different mentality it's not how do you say the chivalrous not chivalrous, in this chivalrous thank chivalrous. you that mm. that's right it's not chivalrous it's his own code in different 
settings of his life. I mean, if we were to go back into the Knights world, I mean, that's true of which is who's the one that's always sleeping with Arthur's Lance wife? Lancelot. <laughs> Lancelot's always sleeping yeah. with Arthur's wife. Probably actually emphasizes the point more that these are meant to be modern knights. Because, you know, mm-hmm. Lancelot, Lancelot's the knight that everyone knows. Mm-hmm. Lancelot's always sleeping. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that actually is very <laughs> similar. <laughs> now, see here, Arthur, me and Guinevere, we're getting back together. You got nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Yeah, and that's something when you read like the Thomas Mallory, like Morty Arthur, who kind of collects these these stories together in, in like the 1470s, a lot of the knights don't come off great either. And there is this code, but there's also a lot of people who fail to live up to this code. And it's part of the, the tension in the book. It's odd. I don't think Sam fails to live up to the code he set out for himself. I just think he, he, I, it just seems like he, he wants to defend his partner because that's what you do. And there isn't any real other reason for it other than that's what you do. There's this, this requirement and he's doing what is necessary to fulfill the requirement of the code. But in life, you can hmm. sleep with your partner. But you can, you can, that's not part of the code. <laughs> That's, That's not part of the code. code. <laughs> That's not part of it. No, she was up. You know, you defend your partner. Um, it doesn't matter whether you like him or not. It's just good for detecting to to do this thing. And you know, if he wants to uh, sleep with his wife, that's fine. And he's not going to warn the partner, right? Because the partner died with a ten thousand dollar life insurance and a wife who didn't love him. That's terrible. It's the way it was. I-, I just picture like on a notepad, like three bullet points with the heading code of, of like a detective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if it's not on that sheet, anything else is fair game. I think. I think there's, there's there are. Two, I think there is. There's only two. There's only two that he ever gives. One is you you def, you know you you have to you know if your partner gets killed you're supposed to do something about it. And the second thing is you don't play the sap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. Two thing. bullet points and the rest of life is fair game. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I do think I mean I I I think what it comes down to is like because we spent a decent amount of time talking about Sam, but like the fun of the movie is I mean it's, it's fun to watch Sam do things. It's fun to watch him like you know trick the you know uh, Wilmer Cook who's like following him and trick him and do this kind of stuff. It's fun to watch that, but the the fun of the movie I think is the other character. It's mm-hmm. like so it's it's those are the ones you wanna you want to know what's going on with them, especially Gutman. <laughs> I love the giant. But he still owns the room, Sam Spade, he does. whenever mm-hmm. he goes into one. Yes. I mean, I just think Gutman and Cairo, it's just, it's, it wouldn't be fun to watch him if he didn't, wouldn't be fun to watch him own a room. Like, you know, when he goes into the room and sort of, you know, shows up the DA, that's no fun. Like, you know, you just watch <laughs> the DA, maybe like, mm. my mother didn't raise a man foolish enough to make, you know, sworn statements in front of a DA. Like, well, who cares? Mm. But it's fun to watch him show up Joel Cairo and punch him in the face multiple yeah. times. That's fun. <laughs> yeah. Or talk to the fat man. Yeah, or talk yeah. to the fat man. Like, Gutman oh. the fat man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like Batman, he needs proper villains to yes. be able he needs to play a proper off rogues him. gallery, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're so different from him, too. I mean, that's the thing. The district attorney, like you're saying, he's kind of part of this world, and also those detectives are. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not in the shadows the way he is. He's much more, Sam is much more a liminal figure. He can go back and forth between the law and and the illegal side of things but those people are still you know tom and um dundee are, are and and the, the da they're still part of this kind of san francisco world the rogues gallery yeah you know, is uh, they're so like soft and flamboyant and kind of avaricious they're just so greedy um but over the top uh we mentioned this so we we had attempted to record this episode before and it, it didn't happen so this is this is a re-record audience but if i had mentioned this before cairo's uh, uh mannerisms with the cane <laughs> which i suggested I watched you did you know yeah. the, did you notice that before or did you notice this only on the rewatch oh no i noticed it before but okay. i watched it this time with with my girlfriend and she's and she's watching that scene and she just goes bro <laughs> as, 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 as he's, i didn't say anything i just said you know in the book it suggested that that maybe he's gay and she's watching the scene and she just goes bro as he's like <laughs> licking the cane or putting it in his mouth um and so yeah that's that's a tremendously fun performance as a sydney green street scutman 
Well, who was it? Who was it who wrote the song? The one about like you know, like uh, uh what's his name? Peter Laurie commit like Peter Laurie uh, uh, contemplating a crime. It's like a famous like '70s song. Oh, really? I don't know it at all. Yeah, there's like a famous '70s song about like, and it talks about Peter Laurie contemplating a crime, and it's just like such a great mm-hmm. image of Peter Laurie. Oh, he's kind of a famous criminal, right, Peter Laurie? At this point, um. We covered his other crime movie, didn't we, earlier? M. M, yeah, an earlier episode. Oh, right, right. Mm. That was him, yep. So, Tom, let me ask you, do you think you could rewrite the Arthur legend as a noir? The the Arthur legend? Um, Well, based upon what Pat is saying, that actually sounds like right? it makes a lot of I sense. I think it might fit. Right? I yeah. think it's exactly what they were going for. And I think if mm. you read even the Arthur myth, I mean, part of the conceit is that, I mean, if you go back to medieval sort of world view your worldview is that you had those who pray who were the monks those who fight who were the knights and those who do things who was everybody else so this conceit that like they they have this is part of their world is they have to do violent things they have to be a part of this world of violence and it and again i think there is this notion that it taints them by being part of it and that's why they have to have this strict code or else you know they're they're literally sort of endangering their souls and i think this is a modern take on the arthur legend so i think i think you mm. could make it really cool mm. looking for a grail about six inches high gives internal life mm. anybody seen it <laughs> as we're going down this path that's exactly what i was picturing the monty python crew in this noir <laughs> <laughs> the multi scrail is that what <laughs> the grail mm. Has there ever been a British guy in the lead of a noir? Like, what's a noir sound like with a British accent? I'm sure they're out there. I'm sure they're out there, yeah. Actually, yeah. Mm. They definitely... um, I'm trying to think. Because well, a noir feels kind of... American? Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Uh, like, I think a, a noir is well, very American, right? I, I don't yeah. know. Mm. Like yeah. a, a Are you thinking really... more like Dick very Tracy? American. Kind of? Yeah, mm. exactly. Yeah. yeah and talk about of... a rogues gallery, I mean, Dick Tracy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. i mean that's yeah that's a great yeah yeah one thing i think pat and i have read this book right the book it's based on and what's interesting about this adaptation is that it's almost scene by scene the book and there's a few minor exceptions um like gutman has a daughter and and so forth but there's one like the one probably major exception is that a story is told at one point that sam tells uh the called the flitcraft paradox um about if i remember it correctly it's been it has been 18 years since i've read the book so let's see how well i do but uh in the flitcraft paradox um sam is asked parable excuse me not paradox parable uh sam is asked not doing so well tom yeah not doing (laughs) so well so far but he's asked to like investigate a disappearance and it's this man disappeared and and sam traces him and he had um apparently was walking and a a piece of a building had fallen and almost killed him and he kind of had this realization that you know he didn't want to be this kind of average middle class man and so he just abandoned his life but then when sam finds him he had gotten married again and just started up another family in a different town um, and I think that there's this line in it, Pat, if you could maybe help me out with, with this, which is like, um, he had abandoned his life when he realized he almost could have died and then took it up again when he realized he didn't. Yeah, essentially, he uses a little bit where he says, like, I think it was like the cur- the curtain of life got pulled back a little bit and he got to peek backstage is I think how he phrases it, something like that, mm-hmm. that he got to peek backstage for a very brief moment. And then he's sort of like, yeah, he freaks out and he, you know, and the thing is that he makes it very clear that like this guy was like left his wife, the family was fully provided for, fully taken care of. And yeah, he just abandoned everything and then, yeah, moved like, and ended up moving like only like a hundred miles away. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it basically Sam Spade says he's like, he married like a woman who was almost exactly the same as the first woman that he married. And, and he says, he said something, he goes, he didn't even know that he had just gone back to the exact same thing that he had previously done. And he tells this story to Bridget, it, it, you know, it's sort of like, it's, it's implied. It's like, why? And it's, it's sort of just dropped into the story. It's like, he tells this whole story, it takes multiple pages and he tells the whole story to Bridget while they're waiting for Cairo to show up. 
Mm -hmm. uh, in that scene there. And he just tells this whole story to Bridget. And basically it's like, it says like Bridget has no idea why he tells him the story. He just tells it and he never explains why he tells it. So it's often considered like, yeah, why is this in the book? Like mm -hmm. why is this given a pretty significant amount of space and time um, and then never mentioned again, has mm -hmm. no bearing on the plot. So would you uh, guys agree it was probably a good cut? Uh, I mean, it's a, to the movie, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it-, it That's what I mean. I, I, that's what I mean. It's to, the movie. to the movie, yes. Um, it, it would make, I mean, literally, I, I mean, it certainly would make the movie a bit, it would, I think it'd be one of those moments you would leave the movie and you'd, you'd kind of be talking about the movie and then you go, why was that there? <laughs> you know, why did, the, why is it, and that's what the book's meant to do. Mm -hmm. So given how clip, you know, the, these, especially 1940s movies, I always feel like they move. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no wasted scenes. There's no wasted time. So yeah, they would, I'm not surprised they cut it. Um, I think it does raise a lot of interesting questions though, that still come up in the movie. Mm -hmm. What questions do you think it raises that are? Uh, I mean, I think I mean, ultimately it's like, well, what, you know, why does he tell this story? I think it does in some ways get back to the previous point we were making is that I think there's a sense and I still think there's a sense in these movies that most people, even, even in this, in the, in this instance, a person who gets a glimpse of like, life is, you can, you can easily die. Like I, th mm -hmm. I think that's sort of the meaning of the flick craft stories. You can easily die. And even people who come to that understanding, they just, they don't, they don't do anything about it. They, they live their mm -hmm. lives exactly the same way. They just go back to it. Someone like Sam Spade is meant to know that he's meant to see these things and he's meant to sort of protect the rest of the world from ever having to deal with mm -hmm. them, ever having to come to that knowledge. Yeah, we haven't talked about Bridget yet. Uh, Bridget O'Shaughnessy and her, you know, various goings on. I mean, she seems to be about as about as archetypal a femme fatale as could exist. I can't think of anybody who's more more ideal <laughs> in terms of what a femme fatale is supposed to be. Um, See, for me, it was interesting watching this film because I actually saw Chinatown first. And mm -hmm. even though this is the origin of that whole initial setup, I'm like, wait a minute, I've seen this movie. <laughs> you know? But yeah. really, Chinatown was the, like a direct homage to that opening. I mean, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Chinatown homage has a, a, quite a few homages to this. Um, it's the Chinatown, like the the femme fatale in Chinatown is, is ironic because uh, she isn't really, she's sort of, well, it's hard to talk about without spoiling that movie, so we won't. Yeah, but well, well, this one's more of a key player, right? Yeah, she's I more mean, of a key player, film. but I think she's also that just kind of the standard, right? She seems to be the standard bearer for what a femme fatale is. It's it's the beautiful, attractive siren, right? She's a siren figure that drags everybody onto the rocks. Like Daphne? In Scooby Doo, what is a femme fatale? What I, I'm, I've heard the term <laughs> a lot. But... Yeah, a femme fatale is in these noirs. It's usually the a female, probably a female character who presents a um, a sort of sexual air. She's she is usually very sexual, very hypersexual, um, but she is also extremely dangerous, and she's ah, part of this this okay. criminal world, and she. Uh, and and she's usually intricate to the integral to the plot, right? It's more she, like Velma. I thought you were going to say Jessica Rabbit. Jessica Rabbit is a fan yeah. yeah, there we go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it, I think Bridget. I mean, more than anyone, is that kind of standard femme fatale. Phyllis Dietrichson's the other one. I still mm -hmm. say that. Phyllis Dietrichson. Okay. The dear, and she's the double. She's from Double Indemnity. Double Indemnity. Mm -hmm. Phyllis Dietrichson from Double Indemnity, I think, is more femme fatale. I think that's what people often picture when they think of the femme fatale. Like, I love Bridget O'Shaughnessy, but the she's got the difference with her is she plays a lot of different roles. Like, she sometimes is trying to do the schoolgirl thing. Like, she's much more sort of those kind of types, and 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 you don't necessarily know whether she's evil throughout it. Like, there's always some sort of question about it. Whereas Phyllis Dietrichson, you know, from the very very beginning, is problem. And everyone knows it, including the guy who's being seduced by her knows it, but he still does it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main difference between the two is that is that there's more mystery in in uh, Maltese Falcon as to you don't you don't necessarily know that she's a problem until you get sort of further into it. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'd so like to that's the one actress from 
double indemnity, correct? The one you were double indemnity is the main character. The, the the femme fatale now is named Phyllis Dietrichson. I do think she's more when people picture mm-hmm. a femme fatale. I think Phyllis Dietrichson's a bit more of what they picture, which is just the like she's sort of like you you just know she's trouble right from the moment that she that you see her. You know, like Jessica Rabbit, like it literally Jessica Rabbit's that sort of thing where you know, like oh, this this is there's something wrong here. Like, mm-hmm. you don't necessarily know that there's something wrong. I don't think with Bridget O'Shaughnessy the minute you see her mm-hmm. in the beginning of that film. Well, I'd like to once again congratulate our own Femme Fatale here and winner of the week. Mm-hmm. Pat. He's not a Femme Fatale. <laughs> oh, you could be Pat. I think, you know, he's a masculine Fatale. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. God! <laughs> <laughs> these get these are getting worse and worse. <laughs> we peaked on our better and better. <laughs> you can rate and review this show anywhere podcasts are available. For those viewing in YouTube land, if you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the Talking Studios channel for all our exciting content, and follow us on Twitter at Talking Studios. Check out other shows by Talking Studios, including Keep Making Movies, where we explore micro-budget films, Limited Lexicon, where we play through text-based adventure games, and Get the Point, where we slowly reveal a movie poster and try to guess which movie poster it is. Got a question for us? Call the Talking Studios hotline at 201-467-8679 and leave a message. It may be featured on a future episode. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to Talking Pictures Trivia wherever fine podcasts are found. Join us next time when we discuss a movie from Argentina, The Secret in Their Eyes, from 2009. Stay tuned for our first impressions of this film. Ding, 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 ding. Next week, we'll be discussing El Secreto de Sus Ojos, otherwise known as The Secret in Their Eyes from 2009, recommended by our guest Ragnar. Tom, how was your watch? Were you fond of this or not fond of it? (laughs) Yeah, I was fond of the movie. I'd actually seen the American version first, and I thought it was a train wreck, Uh, not being aware that there actually was a, a film that existed before that. What I like about the movie is it's it's actually pretty sentimental and it does it in a in a pretty nice way. It has a, a sort of gentle touch about things. The relationship between the two main characters is um it, it hits all these kind of conventional notes, but it does it in a sweet way, so you're really drawn in. I think sometimes it that that sentimentality goes awry. It, it kind of goes over the top and th- there's scenes that in which it doesn't work. Um However, I think the the strength of the film is really these these actors and the chemistry between them, and that's what I like most about it. I like watching them um, watching them kind of uh, dwell in this potential for for love, um, and also the actor who plays uh, Gomez. The um, the whoa, whoa spoilers, hus- spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Oh. I was going to say the the husband of the victim. Oh, that's Morales. No. Morales. Oh, I'm sorry, Morales. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, like he's a fantastic actor. I love watching his face, and I, I loved watching when you get to the end. We won't spoil the end, but when you get to the end, the the kind of ironies that are, exist in his performance when you go back and think about them are are, are very enjoyable. Ragnar, how was your watch? Well, uh, this would be, at this point, I think my fifth watch of the movie. Um, I have no recollection on how I came to find it, but I'm very glad I did. I'm probably the biggest fan of this movie that I know. Uh, To me, it's pretty much a perfect film in that there is no scene that I'm watching that I think, oh, I wish they would have done this instead or... Uh, an improvement here, improvement there. I, I was completely satisfied through and through. And just like you, uh, I it's the characters that really uh, make it work and their journey uh, throughout time in Argentina. And I think the big important thing is that 
uh, which you alluded to, is this is a love story wrapped, two love stories wrapped in a, in a, in a crime movie, um, which is just the brutality of the crime and the sweetness of the love stories is it's a very that makes it very well for me um so i think it's a very memorable film uh kj what about you this was my first watch i want to say thanks ragnar for recommending this movie um i did enjoy it it's a really good movie a lot of twists a lot of terms i love the the framing of the shots the cinematography is fantastic um audience particularly they at one point go to a soccer game a football game i guess in argentina and it, it's you can't look away the whole time it's great it, sometimes it felt a little bit too much like csi las vegas or something but that, i i really think it's a good movie i think you'll enjoy it audience. buenos aires <laughs> csi <laughs> buenos aires um stand back uh how about you nick what do you think I also never heard of this film. And then I realized it won the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. So I did not realize that until after I even watched the film and realized, okay, that, that could be true. I enjoyed it for many of the reasons Ragnar said, but the other element, which you may not expect based on the subject matter, is there's a fair amount of comedy in it too. There's some good lines. There's some yeah. good banter. So even though you're dealing with something very heavy, there were these moments to kind of break it up and make you chuckle. So I, I, I did enjoy this film and I, I probably never would have watched it if it wasn't for Ragnar's recommendation or this show, which is exactly why I do this. The Secret in Their Eyes is available on DirecTV at the time of this recording. Wow, Talking Studios.